ladies and men and non-binary friends. Thank you so much for joining us tonight at RJ Julia. I'm Kristen. I'm just going to talk us in real quick and introduce you to all of our uh, guests for this evening on this fantastic Pride panel. Uh, so we're going to start here. I'm going to end with you because, you know, save the, <laughs> <laughs> the cherry on top. Um, so our authors tonight, Lev Rosen uh, is the author of books, including Camp, uh, Jack and Hart, and other partners. Uh, Lavender House. Uh, this year, most recently, he's come out with the Young Adult Book Lions Legacy. Um, and this fall, the sequel to Lavender House will be out. Um, so get ready for that. Um, that book is a finalist for the Lambda Literary LGBTQ Mystery Prize. And I've been practicing saying that all day red leather, yellow leather. <laughs> Got it. <laughs> um, next up, we have Margot Duahi. Uh, who is the author of uh, Scranton Lace and Scorched Grapes. She is a connoisseur of uh, voice and place. Did not realize the rhyme scheme until I did that. <laughs> I'm very impressed. <laughs> um, then we have Tembi Denhurst, uh, who is the first time author of Home Bodies, which is a most anticipated book of 2023. Um, you are um, also uh, at the New York Magazine Strategist, where you cover topics including books and style and fashion. Mm -hmm. um, and then last, of course, we have Jeffrey Dale Lawton, uh, who comes to us from Washington, DC. He's a senior advisor at the Library of Congress and his debut novel, Red Clay Susie, has been tagged also for the Lambda Literary Most Anticipated LGBTQ Book of 2023, um, as well as the Seven Hills Literary Prize. And then last, but certainly not least, <laughs> we have <laughs> Troy Jackson, our moderator for this evening. Uh, Troy comes to us from Toy Tor Forge uh, Publishing. Uh, she is a writer, an editor, a paranormal enthusiast, and I've said it before and I'm going to say it again, damn fine dresser. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you so much for joining us tonight at the Pride panel, and please join me in welcoming our guests. Hi, everybody. Happy Pride. Um, I'm so excited to be here today. I'm so excited to be here with these panelists, and I'm so excited to dive deep into all of these beautiful books. Um, so I wanted to start out today by asking you, what inspired you to write this particular book? What made you sit down and decide this is going to be the one? Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so sorry. Yeah, it's <laughs> Uh, yeah, uh, Lavender House uh, came from uh, a few places, but uh, I always had a love of noir, and I always knew I wanted to write a noir, um, and I always was sort of looking for a way to create that in, uh, create that up, but I didn't, I didn't feel as though that was something that could be sold uh, at the beginning of my career, and it wasn't until I had originally gone into young adults uh, where I was writing my first queer protagonists and finding that it was welcome there. It wasn't until I, I, I found my footing there and sort of felt like queerness was welcome in the YA space that I moved back into adult with the queer protagonist. Um, but the the way I found a way in was watching a truly ridiculous adaptation of an Agatha Christie book. And I was like, oh, I'm gonna do that. But I was thinking to myself, I was like, this is absurd, but wouldn't it be more fun if everyone were gay? And then I was like, oh, I'll do that. I'll just do that. And that's where it all fell into place. Yeah. <laughs> Similarly, noir has always captivated me. All, the fact that all the, as we were uh, walking up, the idea that all the characters are fallen, all the characters are compromised. So whether it's from that angle of, you know, film noir and some of those tropes like the, the Tao or the Avenging Angel, they've always just really intrigued me and kind of seized and, and arrested my interest. So particularly in the hard-boiled school, that idea of like the, I'm a lone wolf on the main streets and the world of contrast really spoke to me and I wanted to bring that kind of queer sensibility to it in an unexpected way. So my character, my my sleuth is an amateur, amateur sleuth, but she's also a mystery fan. There's a lot of intertextuality there. And she's a you know 33-year-old gold tooth, tatted up, uh, punk rock nun. And so <laughs> all of those contours kind of make her this interesting, messy person. But I find that in the in the messiness, there's a richness. And so she's somewhat surprising to herself, but throughout her exploration of what even mysteries are you know you have this kind of cascade of who is this character the whodunit 
um, the people behind the whodunit kind of state crime. And so I like to layer those mysteries on, on top of one another. And really from that inspiration from Raymond Chandler, Dashiell Hammett, Sue Grafton, the kind of tough brawler sort of, you know, cigarette smoking, again, that solitary, solitary figure of the insider outsider is someone that I really want to just inhabit and subvert and just recast in a completely different way. So again, kind of, of that love of this category is just really kind of inspiring me to think more expansively about it. Yeah, um, for me, I always knew that my protagonist was going to be like a black woman because I was, I wanted to write about someone who looked like me. Um, I dedicated my books to women who look and love like me, and so it felt very natural. And I think the protagonist might always be black and lesbian because I just it's what excites me and what kind of lights me up and what I'm interested in. Um, for the book specifically, I took a writing workshop and I had like nothing to turn in. So everyone, they were like, oh, like five to 30 pages. And I was like, I don't have nothing. <laughs> um, so I was just like, what can I write about? And originally I thought I was going to write some kind of like love story or something like that. And then um, Mickey started kind of speaking to me in the first uh, scene that I wrote with her in this grocery store, like reconnecting with, seeing her ex after like five or six years. And I thought it was going to be a short story. And I was like, oh, it's going to be some kind of like, she's home and it's like this small and it just got so unwieldy and I ended up really tapping into the like media setting and like thinking channeling my own layoff and being like how did I feel and like giving myself the opportunity to explore all of these different things on the page and it ended up being really a meditation on what it means to be a black woman in the media space what it means to be black and queer in your life and you know, it ended up being a lot of other things, but I think that initial like spark of inspiration was really just like a prompt of being like, you need to turn something in. <laughs> and then I realized that I kind of had this story inside of me. I don't know if I totally knew that when I started. So yeah, it just kind of evolved sort of organically. Well, I started writing Red Clay Susie when I first left home to attend college, the Grange College, very small, you know, liberal arts institution in LaGrange, Georgia, this big. Uh, and um, the, it wasn't that far from where I grew up. It was only like 30 miles down the road. But the big difference is that I wasn't at home for the first time. And I was away from home. And I almost lost my mind. I had spent years forcing down inside of me years of humiliation and shame and anger and confusion, having been bullied and body shamed by my community, members of my own extended family. Um, and what came to me as an instinct was to write in a journal. Uh, it came out of me and looked a lot like a novel. And I, um, school work just got in the way. Of course, it you know, overwhelmed me, as one might expect, being the first time away. And, in college. And so I put it away. I intended to go back to it when I had, you know, like college sea legs under me. But I didn't go back to it for years, for decades. And to fast forward to a few years ago, and I live in Washington, D.C. now, and I read two books in succession. I reread um, To Kill a Mockingbird. I read it years ago uh, in school. Uh, but this time when I read it, there was a shock of recognition for this outsider protagonist child and um, and this, this community that she lived in. And then I read for the first time, and I didn't see the film, Call Me By Your Name. And those two books together, it was like... It was like two sticks of kindling rubbed together by the most effeminate little boy scout you've ever seen. <laughs> and it just broke me wide open. It's the power of literature for me. I think you've all you know what that's like, being book lovers. Um, and I pulled out those journals and I said, I've got to finish this. You know, I've got to get through this process. So I only time that really worked for me was to write on my mobile phone on the subway going to and from my job at the Library of Congress. And so I wrote the first draft on my telephone. And about halfway through, I, you know, I realized it wasn't really for me anymore. It was for the queer community, young queer community. 
he's having a rough time of it. But that's when it began and how it ended for me. These are all such wonderful stories. I think that what really resonates with all of them is that it was as much about figuring out your own identity and connecting with it through the lens of fiction as it was about figuring out a protagonist and figuring out a completely different character that is not you. I'm going to completely stepped away from you. Um, something that I noticed in all of these books and in a lot of queer media is that it focuses a lot on identity through finding a home and finding a community. Um, what do you think about queer media tends to attract those themes and how did you explore those in your book? <laughs> you're right here in my guinea pig. <laughs> And also housing, you know, titles, <laughs> yeah. you know. Right, the first domino every time. <laughs> um, I think that, uh, you know, as queer people, one thing we sort of always realize is that, you know, we need to go out into the world to find our queer families and to make those queer families um, because most of us uh, aren't born into queer families. And, uh, you know, we have our bio family and hopefully they are loving, sometimes they're not. Um, but to be able to uh, create, to be able to find people like us, essentially, we have to assemble them. <laughs> we have to go out and find them and bring them together and make them part of our world, which can be weird and messy because sometimes like you know lust is involved and sometimes you don't know if it's friendship or romantic and if it's romantic first it becomes friendship it is all very messy um and that is part of the delight of it too I think eventually <laughs> but um I think that also you know it, it, that's why we are are drawn to these stories of finding that community because we are always assembling our community. We are always finding new people to add to our family or being in situations where people leave you. And because of that, the sense, our sense of identity is very often dependent on the people around us. Yeah, it's beautiful sad. I, I mean, so much, so much of Scorch Grace really dovetails with that. And, you know, I have a character who's really out and loud and proud in Brooklyn, and she actually makes this countercultural move to move to New Orleans and join a convent. So amidst, you know, the real confusion of her whole community and her family, for example. So I, I try to flip that as well, just those expectations about where and when we find ourselves and what it is, what is a higher kind of calling mean. I'm really interested in in identity through work also. And so for this particular character, she's a music teacher, but she is, her secret, her big secret is that she's actually quite devout. And so she sort of comes out in that way by joining this progressive, but nonetheless, you know, Catholic uh, order of nuns called the Sisters of Sublime Blood. So I'm playing with a lot of tropes that I, I'm trying to both explore and expand that also you know honor while I'm taking them in different directions but identity in the ways that imbricated identities create the very richness that we are might seem kind of like victory to the outside world but nonetheless they give us the passion to move through the world to try to figure out what it is that we really want from our lives to kind of step into the moment and step into ourselves even if it seems completely insane to everybody else. And so then, of course, I give her the obsession of trying to solve this mystery and you know, this arson spree that has struck her community. So playing with the whodunit, that idea of, you know, the identity of I must solve this, you know, the sleuth identity and the queer identity is really kind of go hand in love. Mm -hmm. It's, you brought up, like, investigating identity through work, and that is at the core what homebodies is dealing with one of ways. Um and when it comes to community, a lot of the characters that Mickey is inter like interfacing with throughout the book, they're her mirrors and everyone is a mirror for her in a lot of ways. Um and it's less for her, I guess there's some elements of found family, but a lot of it is her grappling with her bio family or the people that she's known for her whole life and kind of the ways that we have to return in order to understand oneself. And it's all about her like finding this context especially when work is no longer the thing that's like propping her up and giving her identity. So 
Yeah, I think that like when it comes to queer media, there's a big emphasis on community because I think there's this kind of implicit awareness of the fact that like being queer in a world that is not inherently so is difficult. So I think the focus is on, it kind of offers this kind of like hope in a sense. It offers a framework with, through which to understand oneself. And I think that's the way that people have been able to manage and been able to thrive and been able to survive is through like relying on people who really owe you nothing. Mm -hmm. um, but you build something really beautiful with those people. And so I think that that's like the, you know, that's the draw, or like that's why those themes keep coming up. And I think that that is just a testament to the foundation that was laid by like queer elders and queer ancestors. Um, Homebodies doesn't deal with it so much, but ultimately that's like in the background of Mickey's consciousness because she is a, mm -hmm. you know, that's our identity. Yeah. I think that is so beautiful. Those who owe us nothing are the ones who help us survive. That is, isn't that beautiful? I love that. Um, Ray Clay Susie is, the, it said in the 1960s and 70s primarily, a little bit into the 80s, that this queer outsider child is looking for a community. And one of the reasons I really wanted to explore that in the story is because what I would like to do is cr to create a, a roadmap of sorts, not a roadmap for a car to travel on, but a roadmap within a heart and a mind. Um, maybe uh, this child's example of how to work through it, given so many limited resources in a very small um, community, conservative world. You can, until you find those people who owe you nothing, but love you and will do anything for you, you have to be strong and find your strength within yourself. That's ultimately the story that I wanted to create. That's why I finished it, not for myself, but for people I'll never meet. Um, and I had an interesting conversation with some other authors recently. We talked about community. I'm like, what is our responsibility for the larger queer community when we when we leave a place that was our original home, maybe smaller, maybe conservative. Because even though we left, there were still queer people there. It may not be as visible, may not be able to be visible. So that was, an, I, I, I'm really interested in that conversation too, about how do we, if we leave, if we choose to leave or have to leave, or can't leave, what is our commitment to each other? No, I think, I think what all of this circles on, and I think what's really gorgeous about not only all of these books, but about all of us here, about all of you, is that uh, at the core of it, it really is about being able to service not only yourself, to be the person that you are, and to be that person with as much love as you can give, but also to be that person for everyone around you, um, and finding the people who you can give that love to in a way that really, that really matters, and that really will persist over the course of your lives, um, I think is really gorgeous, and I think all of these books really represent that in a beautiful way. Um, pivoting slightly, but in the same vein, I'd love to hear about and love, I promise, Jeffrey, I'll give you the time. And <laughs> um, I'd love to hear about what queer stories are you looking for in media? What do you want to hear more about? What do you want to see more of? Oh, well, okay. <laughs> um, I want to... So I'll start with I want to I want to see more of them, just more of them, because the more of them we create, the more difficult it is for these people to ban them. They can't ban all of them. So I say more, more queer content, more queer content. That's uh, I think a really important um, strategy, I guess, or tactic, strategy or tactic. But what do I want? I want. I want all kinds of stories. I want stories of hope. I want stories that will break you apart and never put you back together again. Because that's the stories that, those are the lives that our community, people in our community live. So diversity uh, within that queer uh, space, I think is really important. Personally, I love stories that are ultimately uplifting and hopeful. Um, slices of life, I guess you might say. It doesn't mean it's always happy, but those are the kinds of stories that really resonate with me and draw me in. Um, 
I love a good mystery too. <laughs> and, but I think there's so many, what really excites me is that there are so many stories that haven't been told yet. And part of that, I think, is that people don't feel safe to tell them. Even with, you know, really the authors who show that their voices are, you know, they, they found a way to tell their, their stories freely and with purpose. And um, I think that there's still a, a large uh, slice of our community that doesn't feel that they can do that. I want to hear those stories. If they happen to be what I tend towards, uh, that's great. But if not, I want to read those too. Okay. <laughs> um, uh, for me, I want to just read more stories about Black love. I love writing about love. It's like, to me, my favorite entry point into any conversation. Um, so I just want to read more about that. Uh, also more like surrealism. And like, I want to see more... I think that queer is such an interesting way to, it's such an interesting lens in which to see the world. Like, you know, being gay, being queer, being anything, it's like you have such a unique, you're situated in such a unique way because like your everyday problems are not the same as everybody else's everyday problems. And so I think it like can like be a very fruitful soil from which to write and from which to explore things, especially in like the speculative space or in even like a slice of life story, it's like like really digging into these like everyday, seemingly mundane things that are like really not all that mundane because they, they're not like the same for everybody. They're more complex for us, aren't they? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Like I think really one of the stories I feel like sticks out for me is there's a show Matt Served None in like season three, which was like done by the way, but there's like this very specific episode, episode three, um, that is about this like single black woman trying to have a baby. And she's a queer woman as well and so that was just like so uh, impactful to me because it was just I was like wow like it was just there was like so much about it that was like you're going through this journey with her it's so deeply human it's so vulnerable it's all these things but she's a black lesbian woman and I think that so often in trying to kind of convey humanity she's not strong she's not like speaking she's not kind of like playing to any trope or isn't written in a way that suggests that she's anything under, other than who she is it's specific but it's universal so i want to see more stories like that that are deeply human and they don't transcend identity but they are they like are deeply rooted in identity but the story is so deeply human that anyone can relate to it and so i love that that's like what to me always wanted to read yeah those those granularities and just digging down into the specifics are so satisfying and I love being tangled at the intersection. So to be, you know, Gen X with neurodivergence, queer and out of a job, you know, like <laughs> that might have explained me, you know, a couple of months ago. And so I find that just those, the ways that we, again, move through the world, I, I'd like that you illuminated that because there is something like really interesting that sort of sparkles when you start to read the more, specific you know mm -hmm. kind of I don't know there's just something really illuminating the further you go I love that rummaging underneath and going deeper into those specificities and I think now is the time to you know really just amplify just more voices I'm third generation Arab American like I'd love to read you know more about the Lebanese diaspora that I don't you know quite encounter as much as I would love to because you know, I want to write more specifically about you know family in that in that way as well because again i think that i don't know the more you can find original dna of something in a literary experience there's just something so validating so hopeful about that those little flames of hope and give me, give me a good heist you know i love a queer heist you know i don't want to like bring that to, to the fore we have some editors in the in the group but like i truly love just all kinds of of storytelling experiences and narratives I love speculative. I find that slipstream kind of ways to play with the absurdity and preciousness of life so compelling. I mean, really just all of it. But of course, my, you know, my heart is, I was a poet for 15 years, but now I'm firmly in the crime fiction world. So for me, crime fiction really is, is where it's at. So that's, I wanted to see more, more of that, a good mystery. I mean, Ace is wild. 
bunch of asexual people uh, full of casino heist. <laughs> Check. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, casino heist. Yeah. Like the most impossible kind of heist. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think, you know, it's interesting. I, I, I get asked that question a lot. What do you want more of? And what do you want next in queer literature? And it's changed over my years of being a published author. Um, and, you know, it used to be, I used to be like, well, just anything. <laughs> um, uh, you know, just just give me some more because there was so little of it. And then, you know, in Young Adult, we saw a lot more like at last year, uh, the or this year, no, last year, the amount of queer books published in the young adult space um, more than doubled. Uh, it was in the hundreds suddenly. It was it was wild, um, and uh, you know there was so many of them had gone from uh, before. It used to be like queer books were essentially uh, relegated to the adult literary world, and they were they were often depressing. Um, and you know, there were, there were a lot of AIDS books. There were a lot of sad books. Um, and that's fine, those books are necessary. Um, and then we started seeing sort of sad and uh, coming out books and YA, less sad coming out books. And then all of a sudden, like last year, it was like all queer joy, queer joy everywhere, um, uh, which was wonderful. And in the adult world, all of a sudden queerness is like taking the genre by storm. There are so many queer science fiction books. We're seeing more and more queer mystery. Queer romance is finally going mainstream. So it's very exciting right now in terms of queer literature. And I feel like all the things we want, and this might just be ridiculous idealism, but I feel like we're headed towards a world where we can get them. Um, and so for me, what would be really exciting, I guess, is um, getting to see some of the stuff that we miss out on, if that makes any sense at all. Um, uh, which is to say, like, uh, going back to genres that have had their time and are considered perhaps dated now, and, you know, having people reinsert the queer people that were there. Um, and obviously, I try to do that in Lavender House to extent, but I also try to do it in some of my other books, where we take these genres, these moments in history where queer people existed, and where they were not allowed to tell their stories, or if they did, they were often erased uh, shortly afterwards, uh, forgotten, etc. So that's what I really love to see. As we move forward, I also want to bring the past with us. That, to me, would be really exciting. That's a really great point, too, because so many things, for me personally, so many uh, aspects of me growing up and being a really avid reader was reading stuff like, I will date myself, I'm so sorry was reading stuff like Twilight and being super excited about it and how bad I want now for there to be queer vampire books but we've kind of given up on vampires um so <laughs> we're doing so much <laughs> but being able to go back to those genres that maybe now traditional publishing isn't as kind on and being able to say wait a second we're going to throw some lesbians in there. Oh, yeah. We're going to take that. Oh, yeah. yeah. So we're going to hear and click yeah. yesterday. <laughs> that was me. That was my yeah. time. That was like, yeah. I was reading all of the boarding school mm -hmm. slash campus. All I, of that. I have the rec, but it's one of my books. So I'll tell you. <laughs> <laughs> Great. But yeah, all of that. Obviously, we need more queer books, period. I need more queer books specifically <laughs> that are about like really weird, like gothic tropes that maybe we haven't done in a bit because they're data is data. Mm -hmm. um, in, in a similar vein to that, kind of, um, I would love to hear about specifically, like what do you think uh, when it comes to queer media that is not necessarily about the queer experience in like how you had said, books that are about coming out and then books that are about sad coming out or books about living the hardship of being a queer person existing within a space. What do you think the importance is in then looking at books that aren't about being queer as being a hardship? Um, books that are just, I happen to be queer, but then I'm dealing with like this whole other thing that has nothing to do with my identity. Um, do you think that those books also need to really be pushed at this time? Yeah. 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 I think, <laughs> yeah. I think that that's kind of like the whole point of homebody is like 
make you scared, but that's like really not the point. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It like it not to say it doesn't matter because it's a, a big part of like for her, her queerness is a space that she doesn't necessarily feel like real sh- it's not like shame, but she feels like she has to overcompensate in her work in order to kind of be like, I'm so great, you can just like not have to talk about this. Mm-hmm. You know, like, oh I'm so great, like you don't have to and her family is like not not accepting, but her parents also aren't like invested in her le- in her relationship. Mm-hmm. So it's kind of like this subtle signal that like we don't really not that we don't accept you, but like this is maybe a lot for us, or this is maybe not our favorite thing, or this is maybe they have all these feelings or they just don't know what to deal with it. So they just kind of you know, it's like a light, it's, it's acceptance light. Yeah. And I think that that is like, maybe it's not everyone's reality, but I think it's becoming more people's reality increasingly. Like, you know, when I came out, my dad is like, he was like, oh, like he wasn't really thrilled with it, but he had voted for gay marriage, right? Mm-hmm. So it's like this idea of like, I want this for everyone, but maybe not my child. Yeah. <laughs> He's since come a long way, but it's like, in the initial, I think he was like, oh, now this is like something I personally have to deal with. Mm-hmm. And so I really wanted to kind of, write characters and write a situation and I think I'll probably continue to like explore these kind of more subtle nuanced living as a lesbian woman or living as a queer person and like the the little ways in which it crops up and not like this is the big arc of you coming out like in a post coming out space yeah mm-hmm. a little bit because I'm like that's like that's more realistic to like how I live now where it's not it's not really something to be commented on it's just the way that I exist yeah and so I want it to be very normal and like normalized so yeah acceptance light oh my gosh yeah and like does that make i totally get that but why does there have to be acceptance at all i can't wait until we to, to the place where there's never the conversation because it doesn't have to be you mm-hmm. know it's a range of options it's not even options because nature is full of diversity nature is full of imperfection where there's nothing that's ideal We've created this idea that this is the way it has to be, and anything out of that, well, we have to approve it. Is it gonna is it gonna move forward? Are we gonna you know accept that stamp that approval? We're not there yet. So that's what I think literature has the power to do. Um here's here's a recommendation for one of those kinds of books. Because I, I believe that's the next that's the next phase of literature is queer people in those situations, and it's it's just secondary, you know. It's mm-hmm. not the point. The point is that we're all we're all the same. That's the point. Well, we're kind of more fabulous, but you know, <laughs> but uh, confidence by Raphael Duncan mm-hmm. is just that kind of story, mm-hmm. and that's why he wrote it that way. He said, "I wanted a story of completely screwed up people, you know, struggling who happen to be queer, but it's not the main point." Yeah, it was important for me too that like. Homebody starting taking the again. Uh, but it was that was like really important for me because yeah. I really wanted it to be a book that like anyone could read and be like, okay, like I'm connecting with this character, but that like black women would read even deeper and black queer women would read it on an even deeper level. You know, it's like it's written specifically for like a black lesbian woman, but like anyone could enjoy it. But like it's more so like okay, I see myself on the page because I remember how important it was for me when I was able to have those experiences and how I was like oh my gosh like this is so exciting like I can't even believe that I'm seeing myself reflected back at me and so I'm like there's I wanted to just like tell a story but then the protagonist like that is her reality and making her reality realistic it's like those things will come up that's not like Mm -hmm. the more she's more so grappling with this idea of like losing her identity and all the things that come with that because she loses her job and so yeah I mean, I think that I, I, it's, I think it's really complicated. I think on one hand, all queer stories are needed. We still need the coming out stories. We still need, especially now, especially for young people, it, as we are witnessing, like, you know, so much litigation and the HRC is declaring a national crisis. Like, we still need stories of resistance and fighting back against homophobia. But we also need those stories that show sort of a a world where we don't have to worry about it. We have to see what we're aspiring to and we see how we get there. We need stories for all of that. And one of the things that, uh, you know, literature does, that fiction does specifically, is it enhances um, our, our empathy. When there's all these studies that have been done, when you read fiction about characters that are different from you, you relate to them. You relate to real people through those books and you understand circumstances better. 
through the the empathy that you get from these books. And so every queer story and every perspective on queerness has the potential to essentially educate anyone and make anyone sort of see what it is like to be queer, whether that is a world where their queerness is not such a big deal or it's a world where they are like fighting other for their lives because they are queer. Both of those kinds of stories and everything in between is going to help everyone, other queer people, straight people, understand what it is like to be queer um, from the highs to the lows. So I do think that every kind of story is is extremely important right now. I mean, the, yeah, the, the heated rhetoric right now is really terrifying. And so there's a culture war. It's been politically expedient to scapegoat trans and queer people, and we're seeing more of that. So as I see that, it's like, okay, more, you know, more queerness, like more, more kind of all of it, amplifying it. And at the end of the day, it's for me, the stories that have buoyed me and given me the hope to kind of get through tough moments are just that the ways that we connect with character through narrative. So like Giovanni's Room, which I taught, and one of my fabulous students is here from Franklin Pierce University, is just that that idea of like a character working through the narrative space of like, who am I? And I could just, you know, sit like see James Baldwin, like writing that, you know, working through his own kind of questions about identity. And then we get this glorious, glorious piece of art, Giovanni's Room, that will outlast, it outlasted him can outlast me, you know, that art outlives us. And so we have, as you were saying, like these contributions to give literature is the human experience. And so we need more of it. It's like, it is becoming more, you know, marketable. And as our fabulous hosts here at RJ Julia know, you know, folks want to buy queer and more, you know, expansive, whether it's genre or just books in general, it's still, you know, as editors, you know, you still have to make cases for it, books still need to sell. So we just have to kind of keep, you know, writing compelling characters, mm -hmm. compelling narrative predicaments that add to the like taxonomy of these great characters, whether it's, you know, the, the greats that we all know, you know, probably that were celebrated like, like the Lambies and you know, Mickey and Homebodies, just like joining the pantheon, you know, of characters that can kind of get us through and that we look to for, for mirroring, for hope, for resilience, and you know, to kind of give us that strength. So, and I, I think more than ever now that we have AI and ChatGPT kind of seeping in more and more and more, the uniqueness, the originality, you know, the personal uniqueness, there's a talent. <laughs> more of it, just like more of of our original kind of doubling down on that. You know, that voice. Well, that's a pep talk. I gotta go. I gotta. <laughs> well, before you go, before you sneak away from us, no, no, go. Um, in the vein of more queer media all across the board, um, I want to hear very quickly. I'm related to books. What queer media have you been really into? And you can't cop out and say a book. You have to give me a show or a song or something. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh. Oh. It will be something like a really great piece of queer media that you picked up recently. I, again, will shout yeah. the rooftops. I've been watching a lot of Yellow Jackets. Yeah. <laughs> uh, lesbians eating each other yeah. in the woods, and I do mean that in the cannibal way. <laughs> it's a lot of fun. I'll go. So, Margot gave me, reminded me, the charisma and uniqueness nerd and talent. So yeah. RuPaul's Drag Race is the obvious <laughs> <laughs> choice. I mean, what a groundbreaking and very, you know, very popular. I mean, it's so mainstream now. That was on Logo? Yes. So yeah. <laughs> like, that was, that was like, when it, like that's early season. Yeah. yeah. I used to watch Logo a lot as a kid, which is like, I was very into it back. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I watched a lot of those art. Like, oh, God. Uh, yeah. So I'm just saying, like, it was just like, I remember Drag Race, like, in the yeah. early days. Like, but yeah. yes, it's like, it's it's so, it's normalized so much about community, our, our culture. Brilliant, you know, and brave. So that's my answer. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Margaret. <laughs> <laughs> I listen to a lot of R&B, and so I have a uh, playlist called, I think it's, it's called From Her to Her, 
And so it's about like, it's just a playlist of like women singing to other women. Mm -hmm. And to me, that's like so good. Yeah. Um, when I was in college, I read this book of criticism called Evening Sugar by almost second Natasha Tinsley. And she talks about the practice of Monty, which is like in Dutch Suriname, there was this common thing. And one thing I find really interesting about queerness is a lot of the ways that you find out that it exists in historical context is because there's laws banning whatever they're doing. Um, <laughs> And it's like for the laws to exist, like there has to be something to litigate. Mm -hmm. um, but they would, like these enslaved women would have this practice of like singing to one another, bringing offerings to one another, and like they called it mati. Mm -hmm. And I just find it really beautiful. I found that really beautiful. But so for me, I kind of just became just in a roundabout way, loving music as well, like fell in love with this idea of women singing to other women because I think it's just kind of like a closed community in a sense um so yeah so a lot of the r&b girls whoever's like singing to other women is like what i'm listening to a lot right now um but yeah like i just think that it's 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 because my life is just populated with so much feminine energy that i just love to see that reflected back in music and tv and anything that i'm like consuming yeah. beautiful um definitely yellow jackets <laughs> And I mean, I've been thinking a lot about AI recently, so I've done, just, I haven't rewatched it, but San Junipero, the Black Mirror episode, mm -hmm. I don't know if you've seen that. It's like the, if you haven't, the contemporary Twilight Zone. And there's the there's an episode, there's a, you know, a queer love story that's just particularly profound. And also I'll point to the really remarkable uh, marriage episode in The Last of Us, really beautiful, elegant, you know, hard, to watch, but absolutely cathartic episode and the guys get married. And I won't spoil it if you haven't seen it, but it's sci-fi, but again, it just comes down to just human experience. Mm -hmm. And and I'm particularly like catharsis. I kind of like to be wrong out like a rat. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I now I now remember it again. What I'm yeah. watching uh this Netflix, this cursed Netflix show, uh -oh. the queer ultimatum situation. I've heard <laughs> of <laughs> it's so cursed. Um, <laughs> Yeah, it's really questionable, but I'm very deep. <laughs> I don't know if you saw Swarm. With, I haven't seen Swarm. Yeah, so that's the one with like Dominique Fishback. Mm -hmm. And so it's all, it's like about, for anyone who hasn't seen it, it's about like this girl who's like obsessed with this Beyonce like figure. And so she's like murdering everyone who doesn't <laughs> like Beyonce, oh, yeah. who doesn't like Nyla, Nyla or whatever her name is. I support that. Yeah, it was, very, <laughs> it was very, yeah, it was very crazy. But like Dominique Fishback is brilliant in it. And then in the last episode, there's just like, I mean, we all know it always ends in murder. Yeah. But there's just like, for the first like 20 minutes of the episode, she's like in love with this girl. Mm -hmm. And I remember, I'm on the couch and I'm screaming and I'm like, I'm next to my fiance. I'm like, babe, what is this? <laughs> <laughs> like because for me i can i always call bullshit when the, like the queen doesn't feel real yeah, but i was like yeah. dominique fishback could be a stud i love this <laughs> no, good she's an actress i was so obsessed like the whole time like everything that they were doing just like her going over to their house and holding hands on the like, chat it's just so cute <laughs> it always ends in murder so it's like not too prolonged but, <laughs> but for that period yeah. yeah for that period i was like i just want to watch this like <laughs> watching like black queer women love on each other I, like that i could just watch that all day like i can they don't even have to have a storyline they could like go to the grocery store yeah. <laughs> be, like oh my god i'm eating it up like they could like hold hands like breathe on each other i'm so into that like, <laughs> oh man um that's okay i got two i got two next uh one is reality show also drag queens on hulu called Drag Me to Dinner, and it is chaotic. Oh, yeah. It is pure chaos. Um, it is <laughs> Neil Patrick Harris with his husband hosting what is essentially supposed to be a drag cooking competition <laughs> where pairs of drag queens compete to create a dinner party for them. But like, obviously, they're not actually cooking. They're like supposedly cooking, but they're not really cooking because it's a disaster. Like, it's just constant chaos. We've only watched a few episodes of it, but it's like a little stressful too, <laughs> but, yeah. but in, in a positive way. And then on the other side, scripted um, the other two, which is um, in its third season now and has gotten progressively 
gayer and also progressively more surreal to the point where a recent episode did a full Pleasantville spoof. <laughs> and I was like, that movie is 25 years old. Like, what are they doing? But it it just, it felt very, like a very gay choice to do a Pleasantville spoof. <laughs> Um, and it is, it gets weirder and weirder and more delightful every episode. Uh -oh. I second that one. That's great. Yeah, yeah, no, it is. It's insane. And it's like, yeah, it's a great show. Sounds incredible. So I'm going to open it up to if anybody in the audience has any questions. There are beautiful panel of authors. Anything? Well, within reason. <laughs> If not, then I believe we're good. Yeah. May, may I mention something? So I brought show and tell, like at school. Uh, but I brought Lid Clay from Georgia and a properly washed Duke's mayonnaise jar. <laughs> <laughs> so if anybody wants to open this and smell it and touch it, you're welcome to. It's um it's a it's there you go. It's 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 surprisingly mild, but the properties of red clay, if you've ever been to the South, you may no, they've experienced it, but it's crazy time. So anyway, I also have a matchbox car. <laughs> 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 Tembi, where is your uh, playlist? Is it on Spotify? From her to her? Oh, yeah, it's on Apple Music. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna listen to this public. I like to look naked. I think it is public. It is public. Okay, okay. 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 I was gonna say yeah. otherwise. More story <laughs> recommendation. <laughs> yeah, it's public. I'm like really into music. A lot of people ask me that about home buddies. They're like, where like what is the like what is the music tie-in? Yeah. So I'm always, like there's just a lot of like random music in books. Yeah, everybody's every book has a soundtrack. Exactly. Oh, yeah. I totally agree. Absolutely. Like whether it's just the, what the author has, you're actually kind of like pull one together for it. Not there's always mm -hmm. I totally agree. Mm -hmm. Well, all of these beautiful, talented, and amazing authors are going to be signing copies of their books, which I highly, highly encourage you to buy. We have copies available around the corner um, at the kids' checkout line and also downstairs as well. So thank you guys so much for joining us tonight. Let's give everybody one more round of applause.